Hey folks, welcome to another video in this series about generative AI. My name is Chris Noring. I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. And in this very exciting lesson, you'll learn how to build your own text generation app. Isn't that super cool? As usual, you can go to this bottom link here at the slide, uh, aka MS Gen AI Beginners, that will show you the entire series of everything you want to know. But this lesson is very hands-on, so without further ado, let's go into Visual Studio Code, your code editor, where you can see how we can craft our own code and build our own AI augmented app. So let's uh, start off here where we used to be, right? We have an open text window. There are a couple of things I want you to know about building apps like this. One of them is uh, how to import uh, Azure OpenAI. We're going to need this to instantiate a client. But before that, we need libraries called OpenAI and .env. OpenAI, this is the library that helps you make it easy to make those calls towards your Azure OpenAI or OpenAI resource and get that response back from your AI assistant. The other bit here is going to help us during development time, and it's called .env. .env has uh, the role of loading secrets and other environment variables from an environment file. Uh, the idea is that you have some kind of key value set up where you say, these are my keys and these are the values that go with it. In general, and this is a very uh, strong recommendation, don't put anything that's secret within your code. Separate secrets from your code typically by having them as environment variables or you know elsewhere somewhere that's not the code because what happens if you check this in someone will be able to use and authenticate and use your resources you don't want that to happen so what we're looking at here is how .env helps us by taking the values within the .env file load those in as environment variables which makes it simple then for us to refer to them as we instantiate our client so here we're building our client by calling Azure OpenAI. There are three things it needs to work. One of them is an endpoint. This is something that you can find within Azure portal with your deployed cloud resource. Next piece of information that it needs is the API key. And this is your unique secret that says that you are you. And then we need to uh, specify the right API version. This one tends to change over time, so definitely check back to our official Microsoft Docs uh, to make sure that you're using the right version. Using the right version will ensure that you have access to the right features on Azure OpenAI. Now, deployment is also one of these things that's important because you can deploy more than one model on the same cloud resource. So imagine that you want to, for example, deploy DaVinci or maybe ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo you need different models for different things, especially if you try to embed code, that's a model of its own. You try to do chat conversation, that's another model and so on and so forth. So you need to read up a little bit on what kind of deployment that you need, but you can think of deployment as a, what type of model am I using? Now on line 18 here, this is the interesting part, right? This is what you feed into your AI uh, application. This is the prompt. This is the instruction that you want some kind of answer to. So in this very simple case, we're saying complete the following. And we're saying once upon a time, there was a something, something. This is a fantastic example of how you can build your own story. So if you've got kids at home or maybe a niece or a nephew and you want to tell them a great story, why not use that AI assistant to be able to do so? And here we establish something called messages and this is how we uh, can establish some kind of prior conversation so this could either be you starting out your conversation or this can be a whole list of messages between you as a user or the system so let me just show you quickly what i mean in case you wanted to establish a really long conversation that's been happening for a while at this point you would just add this and say that the to the system for example that you are you are a curator at the museum. So if you change uh, like this, this will mean that your AI system suddenly changes behavior, that it needs to consider this piece of information before it responds. So this could be super interesting if you want to build an app, for example, that works for museums. Or you can either say it's a curator at the museum, 
or you could even say that it's Abe Lincoln and it would actually tell you a story like it was Abe Lincoln. So uh, lots of different options when it comes to messages, how to customize uh, either by uh, saying that there's a previous history of messages that happens and you take, uh, you continue your uh, AI application with a conversation that you already had, or you use this as an opportunity to kind of tweak that AI assistant of yours to make sure that you get very interesting responses. For now, we'll keep this very simple. All we want to see at this point is a simple prompt and a simple message to make sure that that is actioned upon. Now, to make the actual completion, to get that response back from your AI application, we are calling completions create. And you see here how we set the variables model and messages. And after that, we are trying to print the response coming back as message.content. So without further ado, let's actually try to call this piece of code and make sure that we match the name here, A-O-A-I. Let's see, nope, not that one for now. So this is the very simplest form of this. So give this a couple of seconds because it needs to establish that connection with your resource in the cloud and then it sends the prompt and then you hopefully get that response. So assume that this will take a couple of seconds the first time you run this. But uh, hopefully you'll see how it executes all these lines of code up until line 24 where it should output things. Now. Looking at this, if you remember once more what we wrote to it said, complete the following once upon a time there was a something. So at this point, it would already tell us here's a fairy tale. And you can see here, if you scroll up that we got a very long response back where it says, so if you read this all the way through, you see that you have a fantastic fairy tale where it says, once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess named Aurora who lived in a magnificent castle at the edge of a vast kingdom. Now, if you want to tweak this fairy tale a little bit, once upon a time, there was a, a girl who lived on a spaceship, you will get a very different story. But this is the beautiful part, right? You can take this prompt and tweak it to whatever you want it to do. So now when we ask the very same question again, run this app, we have tweaked the prompt with a different instruction. So hopefully this time around, we get more of a science fiction type setting. Now, if you scroll back, we have our unique story. So if you are a parent, if you are an uncle or aunt, you will be able to be that favorite relative who always tells net new stories. So at this point, we have a girl here called Nova that lives on a spaceship since she was born. And Nova is fascinated by stars and the possibility of discovering new planets. I'm already hooked. I want to hear more about this story and I hope you want to. Now, this is nice, right? I mean, we have a fairy tale story. That's already something that's very useful. But if you want to have an everyday kind of application, you might want to look at an app like this instead. So in an interactive app, you probably have a way to collect information. And how we collect information in Python is by using an input construct. And at this point, we want to tell the user what we're after. So we're saying, I want you to name the number of recipes, for example, five could be one, two, five, and so on. We also want to ask the user for what ingredients is do you have in your fridge or your cupboard? So at this point, we're saying, we think you have something like chicken or potatoes or carrots, whatever have you in your fridge. And then of course, we want to make sure that we are inclusive. So we add some kind of filter that if you are allergic to peanut, we don't want to show you some kind of peanut recipe because that would be bad for your health. And then after we've inputted all of these ingredients, now we construct a prompt that has these templates uh, here with the curly brackets. So number of recipes would be interpolated here. The ingredients is in your cupboard would end up here. And the filter would make sure that we don't have, for example, any recipes containing peanuts. And then ultimately we'll do just like the fairy tale application and uh, set messages and then we end up printing the response. So there's quite a few different bits here. So what we want to do at this point is to clear things up a little bit and see if we can actually run this app as is. So A, O, I, like this, and this. So now that we run this, we expect to be prompted. So number of recipes, two. List of ingredients is, well, if you know Chris, you know that he always have chocolate at home. 
and he probably has, I don't know, caviar. Maybe not the best ingredients for creating something, but hey, it is what it is. And filter, I'm not allergic to peanut, but let's just humor me and say that I am. So at this point, we just wanted to produce a recipe based on this user-driven input. So now it's not only producing recipes that I can use, but also shopping this. But let me show you the two different recipes that we did get. And the first recipe is chocolate caviar tart. Now, I have to admit to myself, I've never tried chocolate and caviar together, so I'm not sure it's a winner. But this one tells us about all-purpose flour, butter, sugar, okay, heavy cream, chocolate chip, and caviar. Mm. I'm a bit, uh, you know, I'm not sure, but hey, let's give it a try. The other recipe here is chocolate caviar truffles. I don't know if that works, maybe it does. Heavy cream, caviar, cocoa powder. But at this point, you might be thinking, that's way more ingredients that I might have in my cupboard or fridge. I mean, you know. And for that reason, there's a shopping list. Hmm. I'm not sure this app works as it should, but I think you get the idea here. So that if you want this app to actually respect the ingredients you have at home, you can always tweak the prompt and say, so here below here, you see that produce a shopping list and please don't. So I thought I was being very courteous here when I say, please don't. You can actually use very strong language here and say, and all ingredients must exist. So at this point, you can be very firm with it. And this is part of the prompt engineering. If you saw those earlier lessons is if that first prompt don't work, you can always tweak it and hope for a better result. Um, this is how you could be solving those kind of problems. But I think you get the idea of how we can build a really rich application with various types of input. Um, and you can keep on prompting as you saw, because we have one prompt here for listing the recipe and another prompt for producing a shopping list. So all of these prompts can work in tandem to produce a greater outcome. And you saw how we took all those simple ideas from that first app of telling a fairy tale story to create a more advanced app, including user prompts. And hopefully now you feel like you have an app that actually produces something of great value to you. But just to see if we actually improve things by changing the prompt a little bit, let's see if we can run it again, hopefully with a better result. Number of recipes, one. And let's say I got chocolate and ice cream. That seems more fair, right? And filter is still peanut. Let's hope it produces something that makes more sense this time. So this time around, it's giving us what? OK. Chocolate ice cream sundae. That sounds pretty good. There's definitely no caviar in there. There's ice cream, chocolate sauce, whipped cream, tablespoon of chocolate chips, maraschino cherry. Sounds good to me. Yeah, and we seem to have a bug with the shopping list, but just given the fact that you have a template to work off of already should make it easier for you to get started. But let's just rehash all our winnings today, everything that we learned today. You saw two, how we built two different apps. You saw the simpler app with the fairy tale. We saw a more uh, fit for purpose kind of application in which we were able to use a food recipe. You, we used that for chocolate or caviar. So we have everything from dessert to, you know, main meal. And let's just rehash the things that really mattered for you to understand how you can build your own first application using AI augmented within your application. So what was important to know is that keep your secrets out of your code. Uh, make sure that those secrets can be read, for example, from an environment file, and make sure that you use a library like .env to do all that heavy lifting to populate your environment variables. So then when you instantiate up the client, that's made really easy. Once you have that client up and ready, now is the fun part in which you create the prompt, the instruction, the input towards your AI app, and you can give it those messages. So it's either a, a new conversation or an existing conversation. And as I showed you in the beginning of the video, you can tweak those messages to have the AI assistant be anyone from Abe Lincoln to uh, Gordon Ramsay. So here you can see on line 21 also how we created our first completion. We sent that towards the AI. We got a message back. And thanks to here on line 24, we're able to print that. 
We also saw in the other example how we could take this and make it really advanced by adding inputs and multiple prompts to create that really great experience, uh, that interactive experience. So hopefully now you all feel very excited about building your own AI apps, whether that app is a space captain or, or Abe Lincoln or maybe your favorite chef. So good luck with that. And hopefully I'll catch you in another video in this series. Thanks so much.